This is Ari Koretsky and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. We are here with renowned screenwriter and Hollywood personality David Weiss. Just before we dive in, a quick note slash apology. We've been having some mic issues recently, trying to get that sorted out. But if the audio quality on my side is subpar or inconsistent, please bear with us. And uh, we're working on that. Meanwhile, David, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you, Rabbi? Very excited to have you on today, David. You are a person who has uh, made a real impact on the Jewish community, uh, spoken in forums all over the world about your really unique story. And I'd love to just dive right in. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up, what your upbringing was like, and let's uh, learn about where you're coming from. Okay, well, I'm, I'm from a little town that's actually on fire right now. Um, oh. in fact, my sister was just evacuated, and then also my brother up in Ventura, California. So if you click on Google News right now, that's the headlines, is that they're, they're evacuating a ton of people. And that fires, by the way, were a frequent occurrence up there when I was a kid. Uh, fires and earthquakes and all that. Ventura is a sleepy little beach town. Um, beautiful place to grow up, very much like Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn kind of land. At least when I was growing up. Now there's a lot more shopping and whatever. But at the time, it was just uh, orchards and uh, oil fields, mostly orchards. And the ocean and the mountains all kind of crunched together. So you know, I used to ride my bike through an orchard to get to school. And, uh, you know, they'd be irrigating. You'd have to go up on the higher parts of it. And uh, we would throw the occasional lemon at a friend or a passing police car. <laughs> 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 and um, it, was, it was kind of idyllic in a lot of ways. Was it Jewish in any way? What was the Jewish population there like? And was it an active one? Well, it was Jewish in that it was created by God. <laughs> 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 but you know, there, was a, there was a beautiful little synagogue there called Temple Beth Torah. Uh, and there were a neat group of families there that really uh, populated my childhood, almost like you'd want to populate a really good dramedy. Um, there were some sitcom moments and there were some tragic moments. Uh, but in you know, like every town, you have your characters and you have your people. So my people were really interesting and wonderful. But there was a lot of, you know, real human drama there. It wasn't a um, religious uh, place per se. There were, I don't remember ever meeting an Orthodox Jew ever until college maybe, or maybe even not until I got to Ireland many years later. That's kind of the first time I really had a relationship with an Orthodox Jew. Um, everybody was a Christian. There were seven Jews in my high school, I think, of 3,000 students, uh, Buena High. And um, so I knew I was Jewish. My family was important to my parents that we were Jewish. And there were, oddly enough, several Jews in our neighborhood, um, you know, in, in Ventura. So we were, you know, a little bit clustered. We all, you know, carpooled up to Temple Beth Torah on Sunday morning for Sunday school. But it wasn't a, a very spiritual experience being Jewish. Uh, but it did give me something to come home to. So, I, you know, as, as we'll talk about, you know, I wandered away from that later. All my friends were Christians. So um, there was also, it's interesting, I look back at Ventura and uh, there was a lot of soap opera there for a small town. You know, we've, we've harkened back and there were a number of, of suicides of people that touched my life when I was a kid, you know, and that, that, to be aware of that so early. These were friends or mentors? Uh, both teachers, friends, it was a young boy, was just after his bar mitzvah from our temple, was my brother's best friend, took his own life with a rifle. How did that land with you as a young child? Well, it, it, um, it colored, it, you know, it colored the landscape quite a bit. Um, uh, there was also, um, there was a sexual predator on our, on our block. So I really, I mean, looking back in a way it was idyllic and in another way it was like a David Lynch film. Uh, it was, there was kind of darker stuff going around in the corners and you don't know as a child. So you, you just, is just life. I mean, this wonderful thing is happening over here and this kind of concerning, surprising thing is happening over there. And by and large, there were more wonderful things by far. Um, but the way the human mind works, I think you tend to fixate on, on the darker stuff. 
So um, I was an anxious kid. Um, and I, I remember at some point I, I couldn't have a sleepover. I mean, I, I have a sleepover, that'd be great. But I go to sleep over at a friend's house and I really wanted to do that. It was something I really loved, you know. Saturday morning cartoons were so much better in color. We had a black and, <laughs> black and white TV. <laughs> so, plus my dad had a limit on how much television we could watch. So if he came in Saturday morning, we were, we were all gathered around watching cartoons. He, uh, he would put the kibosh on that. So a friend's house, parents didn't seem to care. So we could watch all <laughs> in our sleeping bags, you know, and they'd bring, us, they'd bring you waffles. So, <laughs> it was like, so that was great. But at some point, probably around second grade, I started having panic attacks and would head home. And it was a very, I was very ashamed. Like, this is the night I'm going to have a slumber party and I'm going to stay. Uh, but sure enough, as it got a little dark and we tried to fall asleep, panic would kind of creep in. And next thing you know, I was, you know, asking my friend to you know, check with his mom about maybe calling home. And I only lived four doors away. So it wasn't very far. But on the flip side, you know, we would ride our bikes forever. We would ride our bikes to Ojai. Back in those days, you would just get on your bike you know, on a Saturday morning and you wouldn't come home till after the sun was down. And nobody asked where you were. There was no cell phone. Nobody cared. You'd ride out to the fairgrounds and ride the parts of the giant slide that they hadn't taken apart. We'd ride out to Hobo Junction, which was a cool little island off a train trestle out of Stand By Me. If the train came while you were on it, you might have to jump into the lagoon. It was fantastic, but it was real. So as you say, it sounds like... This was sort of an idyllic, but still complex upbringing. I'm curious, did your creative impulse begin to emerge at this early age? Was it obvious to your family and those around you that you had these abilities and these proclivities? And where did you sort of go from there? Well, I was always creative for sure. Um, and my, my parents commented on that and my brothers and sisters that I was, I was always you know, I was quote unquote, the talented one. I think it's what they would talk, you know. And I, I, my first memory of that is that everybody, my grandma, Grandma Molly was a great grandma. You know, she lived to be 93, which back in those days was really something that her, her daughter, my grandmother lived to be 108. Wow. Her last days in our home here actually. And so she was with us longer than any relative that I can think of. You're fixing for about 140, I think. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> We've got longevity on both sides and we've got some abrupt ends on both sides. So, uh, you know, God knows. And uh, I'm good with that. Let, let him keep track of that. So I remember that I was the kid they would have stand up on the chair and sing Mozi at Grandma Molly's. You know, it would be a huge family reunion. My, my grandfather, who was fairly well off from the meatpacking business in Chicago, went during the black market. He was a boxer. We think, think he may have had some mob connections. We, we don't have any proof of it, but he was from Milwaukee, which is where all that started, it seemed. And then he and his brothers got into a meatpacking business when meat was being rationed. And anyway, so they would throw these huge parties and they'd have me stand up on a chair and just belt out Hamotzi. And it was really a concert performance, you know, <laughs> and you know, we were reformed. So we sang the whole English thing, you know, we give thanks to God for bread, you know, but then and I was in the talent show, I'd be all the talent shows. I would put on the Purim spiel. I would write the Purim spiel. It was at one point we had, I'd written it. A junior high school music director came with it and played the organ. He played the perils of Penelope or whatever it is. You know, the silent movie music. Yeah. Ed Heyman was dressed in black on a black horse, tied up all the Jews and put them on the railroad track, you know, and we had a strobe light, which we made out of a fan motor and a, it was shining it through a spotlight. And it was great, you know, and Mordecai came in on a white horse and got the Jews off the tracks. <laughs> My bar mitzvah, you know, to me was a performance. Uh, and then I would win the talent shows and I would, I, you'd run for president in sixth grade and you would win because your skit was funny. Right. You know? I think not much has changed in national elections. <laughs> I wish I'd have said that. that that's the line, Rabbi. Where you go? Uh, don't keep your J job. You know, come, come join me here in Hollywood. So, yeah, it was just all that. Singing, I would sing with my, I would sing. I, I was like, you know, three foot tall and I belted out if I were a rich man, put a pillow in my, under my shirt and was heavy, you know, in seventh grade or eighth grade and, and came in second place, I think, in the talent show. So wow. I was always putting on a show. And so I would imagine you left Ventura around college age. Where did you go from there? Well, I mean, just to save time, uh, let's just let people know if they Google my name and type in, add in the word maybe Jew and then search videos, maybe add in the word Shrek, I don't know. There'll be a lot of videos that come up and, and, and some of them I tell this exact story in a little more colorful way perhaps. But so I'm going to abridge a bunch of it so we can get to your question. But I, I got involved in the church is what happened. I became a born again Christian. So really? I, I don't know if you knew that calling me. Uh, well, nice to talk to you, David. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as I said, I'm Monty Python. I got better. He turned me into a newt. <laughs> Look like a newt. I got better. <laughs> no. So where did that come from and how did that occur? Well, all my friends were Christians. 
And there was this, these swirling questions about why are we here and how do we handle some of this darker stuff going on in the world. And, right. and a real concern with mortality as a young guy, you know, the Cold War, all the stuff going on that just kind of, and, and nobody was talking about the bigger questions like why we're here and you know, what's it all for. That just wasn't getting addressed. It was like, just go to school and go to the football game and, and don't worry about that panic. It'll go away maybe. Just do your chores. And, and we didn't talk about that stuff. And the Temple Beth Torah back in those days, and it has changed quite a bit. Um, I, I know the rabbi there now, and uh, she's a lovely lady, and she's very spiritual, and the community there is much more spiritual. I've been back, actually, to give my story over. And my, my nephew and niece grew up there, so it's changed. But when I was a kid, keep in mind, I was born just 15 years after the Holocaust was over, and it was a different time. Sure. And from what I'm told, just a few years before I came into that synagogue, in the Reform Movement, you took your kippah off when you came into a synagogue. Now, I, I don't have proof of that, but that I've been told that by a class in uh, Introduction to Judaism that we took up at the University of Judaism, which makes sense because it was an effort to try and reform. Like, let's, let's keep the parts that seem to, to travel well to the United States and into the, into the secular world. And again, I don't want to represent uh, incorrectly because you know, I'm not a good spokesman for that cause. But the point is, at the time, there wasn't any big answers coming out. In fact, if anything... I found the, the spiritual side of the temple not helpful. What was helpful was I had some friendships there and the fun we had playing with each other and the family friendships, but spiritually nothing. And so when I was in high school and all my friends were going to campus, you know, life and campus yeah. crusade and, and young life and all these, you know, vibrant religious programs, whereas, you know, there were seven of us in the youth group or whatever it was playing bumper pool with these old guys begging us to stay Jewish, which is not a turn on. You've got to stay Jewish. We're counting on you. It's all going down the drain. <laughs> you know, it's like, something's not right here. And the church was warm and inviting and all the cool people went there, you know, and they had better pancake breakfasts and they had great singing and they did drama. And in fact, it's funny. I remember trying to talk to the rabbi into letting me use the stage. I'd, I'd subscribed to some sort of drama club. That they sent you playbooklets every once a month. And I didn't know what the plays were about. But the idea of mounting our own play on that stage that doesn't get used during the week. And the rabbi was just not interested in doing secular, weird plays with a kid that didn't know what the plays meant just because he wanted to put on a show. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, my best friends take me to their church and they're doing Godspell. Stephen Schwartz's Godspell. He go on to write Wicked and the music to Enchanted. And he's one of the greatest you know, uh, you know, composers on Broadway and playwrights. And, and now they're doing Godspell. And I'm listening to this music on a church retreat over and over. And I love the songs, you know, I'm, I'm memorized, you know, some men are born to live at ease, doing what they please, richer than the bees are in honey, you know, this kind of thing. And I got in, I got into the play. I ended up doing Godspell with this church group and touring around the county with them to various churches. And the friendships that you form in theater are mm -hmm. so tight and are, are almost spiritual. And that, to that date, was the most wonderful spiritual experience I'd had. And I thought that I knew what Judaism was. I thought right. I, I was an expert on Judaism. In Ventura, I was. The, the fact that you were Jewish made you an expert because there was either non-Jews and Jews. And so if you were a Jew, you were the expert. And amongst my peers, you know, nobody really, none of us had read the Bible. You know, we right. barely read the one Aliyah of the, we called our Torah portion for our Bar Mitzvah. So it was a natural to fall into that. Did you feel like you were finding big answers there? Because on the one hand, it sounded like you were looking for the answers to big questions. But what it really sounds like is that you found a much more vibrant community, a home. Uh, there were a couple of big questions. One big question is, where's the spotlight? <laughs> that was one of the questions. They definitely answered that. And the other one was, yeah, I felt lonely and frightened in the world. And, you know, okay. by my parents, uh, the marriage was rocky. And by the time I was in, I guess, eighth grade, they divorced. Okay. And, um, and, and I mean, looking back, even I, I, looked, I was looking through my yearbooks at some point, getting ready for a high school reunion or something. I was amazed in my going into ninth grade, how many people had written in my yearbook, hey, Dave, I'm so sorry you have to go through all this. You'll get through it. You're a great kid. Teachers and students alike. Because back in that day, a divorce wasn't as common. Right sure. now, it's, nobody even blinks. But back then, you were one of a handful, you know, of people that, that, whose family was going through that. So there was a lot of loneliness, and the church people were there to pick up the pieces and, and the broken children, and they were very supportive. And then my mom passed away. By then, I was already in the church. But I, even my father was blown away because, again, there, there, was, no, there was no orthodox community. So right. everything that happens in a shiva house, you know how the community in a Jewish community, they just descend on your life, and life just gets, happens 
The people come and they bring food and they take out this and laundry gets done and the house gets cleaned and kids are taken care of and you don't know what hits you and you, you just are able to grieve. That happened in our home via the church. And Shiva was a three hour affair of a bunch of people who I really didn't want to see from the temple who came because this is what we do. We have a you know, three hour Shiva visit. And the bigger question side, the Christians are all about God Almighty. Yeah. They're also about his son. There's no question. But it's a package for them. And it's really about an utter devotion and obedience. And God bless the church for this. There is a passion for God. There's a passion to follow God and to do his will and to know his will. And that was the answer to huge questions, combined with a deep abiding belief in heaven and the reward in the hereafter and the need to, to be on the right side of that equation. That part didn't affect me as much. Being a good Reformed Jew or regular, any kind of Jew, how often do you hear a Jew going, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to go to hell. No, I'm afraid my mom's going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> that we hear. That's in its own self a little hell. So the hell part of it never really, I, I wasn't looking for, for salvation. It, not, in a, not in a Christian sense. I was looking for belonging. And I was interested in heaven because I, I was afraid of death. Not that I was afraid of hell. I was just afraid that that was it and we were done and we'd never see anybody we loved again. And we'd be yeah. all over the box in the ground. So that was the big answer. And then being a Jewish-brained kid, the discipline and the logic of it, the tumul- I mean, it's, I had never studied Talmud, but we Jews are just, you know, we're, there's a great book by uh, David Mamet called Godzilla versus Bambi, I think. I think, I think that's based on a Saturday Night Live sketch where just a foot comes down and squishes Bambi. That was it. It was a short film. Godzilla versus Bambi. <laughs> <laughs> and a foot comes down and squishes Bambi. And that's the end. <laughs> I don't remember why he even brought that up. But in the book, he talks about why Jews are such good writers and directors. And he puts forth a theory that it basically, it's kind of, a, it's on the spectrum of Asperger's, right? There is an intense focus on the task at hand to the exclusion of all else and a disconcern with social mores and being polite. And, and you know, that's the, kind of the worst characteristic that you'll hear somebody if they're going to characterize kind of the typical New York Jew. But he says, you know, Talmud study is this intense focus, looking down, we don't notice, you know, and, and it's an empowering logical exercise. It's like, you know, Sudoku on steroids. And the smartest, nebbyish, nerdish guy, the rabbi's son, got the best girl in the village. So there was this genetic Darwinistic thing to, to basically propagate the race with the smartest, bookish, and most beautiful, and, and, and sturdiest, healthiest, best cholent-making people. <laughs> and, and essentially, he said, well, that's directors and writers. We, we don't pay, we just we're staring at the, no, everything, yeah, I don't care, you don't mind yelling at somebody, and yeah, no, this is, get, get the shot right. I mean, it just sounds like kiddish. <laughs> get away from the cholent, it's not ready. <laughs> get the kids away from the cholent. But I took that into Christianity. And so I was a bit annoying. People loved my passion, but I was like, well, wait a second. If God is real, why aren't we spending every waking moment of the day serving him? Why aren't we up at 6.30 in the morning having a Bible study? I'd never heard of chakris. Right. But it was in my bone marrow. And I was the guy in that 6.30 a.m. Bible study. And my group of college friends, we all got together at 6.30, two or three times a week at somebody's house. Then we all went to the junior college together and had breakfast together. It was a really tight fellowship. But I was hungry for it. And I went to college briefing camp, which was an intellectual based kind of college up at Forest Home Christian Conference Center. And I was in it in a huge way. Wow. And the church leaders really liked that about me, my passion, my fervor. What it really was, was a Jewish caterpillar in a cocoon waiting to come out, trying to find observance, really, you know, scholarship and Talmud study. And I, I didn't know it though at the time. So when did you know it? Well, I was doing, I ended up uh, as part of this media team uh, at the Presbyterian Church in Ventura, doing all this great fun media. We had a blast. And the youth ministers were wonderful guys. A couple of guys that came through that, that became real mentors and friends to me. And they gave, they gave me enough rope to, you know, um, cause some trouble. And so, but we did the most outlandish, silly, crazy dramas to bring the kids in and everybody have a good time. And I fell in love with a young, uh, young lady who was on that team. And we started dating and her mom basically said, you got to send this kid off to Hollywood. If he doesn't try it for real, he's going to wake up one day and really resent that he didn't go after his dreams. And this is cute. It's nice, but it's not going to, not for a lifetime. And she, it was really her mom who urged me to go. The girl had asked if we should maybe get married, asked her mom about that. And the mom, who, who to this day I'm close to, and really? I'm a huge, of course, a tove to the mom, mm-hmm. uh, because 
she was, she's real supportive. She just wanted to see me succeed. And she, she was like a, you know, my mom had passed away. So there was, she was sort of like a surrogate mom. Yeah. And a number of those in town, thank God. And off I went. I went back to Pepperdine, studied theater. And the theater professor was there, said, dude, you should be in film school. And I applied to USC, applied as a big born again Christian. My, you know, my state, my, you know, statement to get in, the application statement was just like six pages of, of let's share the gospel with the world through film. And they, you know, they were looking for people with a point of view and they didn't care what it was. They wanted passion and a point of view. And I got in, made a film that was a, uh, a religious toned, crazy film. You can still see it online. It's about 18 minutes of madness. <laughs> it's, you know, I've got a great title for it. We could call it Passion of the Weiss. <laughs> you know what? That is pretty good. That's pretty good. But it was actually called The Man Who Loved Fat Dancing. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, it's available online um, in two parts. But it won some awards. It was great. I and mean, we had special effects and monsters and demons and faith. This was, uh, you know, 25, 30 years ago. And that won some awards. It got me an agent. And that got me some gigs. And I started writing. And at first, too much Christian stuff. So people didn't want to hire me. And then I wound up uh, working for Don Bluth in Ireland. And the details of all that are pretty funny. But uh, you can find that online. And in, in Ireland, I met a young Orthodox Jew by the name of David Steinberg. Not the famous comedian, but he's still pretty famous in the Jewish community just because he's such a great guy. He was from Chicago. He had a Jewish education. And I actually went to him to see if he would help me teach some classes at my church. Not, not he wouldn't. Just tell about his Judaism. Tell us about your religion, all this crazy Orthodox stuff you do and the festivals and whatever. And he came and it started a dialogue. He was uh, an animator at Sullivan Bluth Studios where we did All Dogs Go to Heaven, my first film. And uh, we kind of were wary of each other at first because he was this kind of intense Orthodox guy. And that kind of freaked me out a little bit. And he thought I was a Jew for Jesus. And, uh, Which you kind of were. <laughs> by, dis by description only, the actual sort of bothered me. That's what I meant, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, he did this class. We became really good friends. And uh, the more I got to know him, the more I was troubled by the beauty of his observance and the way it seemed to negate the need for Jesus, for a Jew. That's a whole paradoxical thing there because I have so many beautiful Christian friends and I just I want to be respectful, you know? Yeah. Um, but my own personal journey led me to a place where I can't honestly say that I think that that's the true path now. Look, I was a guy that passionately wanted to be obedient to God. And the more I learned about commandments, and the more I learned about God saying things like, no, I want you to honor and keep the Sabbath forever. I want you to keep kosher forever. And, right. you know, I, as a Christian, I'd heard Paul talk about, oh, the law of the Lord brings death. One man brought death through the law, Adam, and he ate, the, you know, he, he caused, brought sin to mankind. And so too through one man, you know, and in the book of Romans, we're hearing all about this, the law is death, and no one can keep the whole law, and anyone who becomes guilty of even the smallest part of the law is guilty of the whole law, which is Meshuggah, right? This whole notion that you can't keep the law, and here's David Steinberg keeping the law. And then you say, well, he doesn't do it perfectly, to which I would say, well, do you believe in Jesus perfectly? Oh, but he forgives me for that. Well, guess what? <laughs> God forgives us for not keeping the law perfectly. In fact, that even, you can find that in Psalms. is one of the Psalms we read every day, it's when we're putting the Torah away. In fact, after I came back to Judaism, a missionary friend of mine from Ireland who I'd been really close with called me, really concerned and said, David, look at this. I think it's Psalm 24, maybe. Yeah. Look at this verse. Who can stand on the mountain of the Lord? Who can stand in this place? One of, of clean lips and whose hands have not sinned and who's perfectly, you know, right? And he said, is your heart clean? Are your lips pure? I mean, can you stand in this place, David? And only because we had just dovened it that day and I have this habit of trying to see what these crazy prayers say because they're all in Hebrew. And so I mean, <laughs> Each week, I sort of try and read a couple more lines in English and sort of memorize it. Like, one day, I will know what we're actually saying. I happened to be working on that one. I, I said, Hunter, what's the next line? And the next line in that psalm is, this is the generation of those who seek him out. This is the nation. You asked a question, who can stand in this place of God? Well, I'll tell you who. The Jewish people. Because they're working their best program to keep this law. It's a far cry from Paul. And I got to give it, King David came a little earlier and had a little higher rank. He was writing the word of God. Now, Paul claims the same thing, but I equate him with Joseph Smith, who also said he was writing the word of God. And the Mormons and the Christians all agree with the Jews that David wrote the word of God. <laughs> We're all, we all have a little disagreement about the other two. So I'll tell my Christian friends, like, I know you want to quote the New Testament. Look, if the New Testament is the word of God, then, you know, yeah, I might be in a little bit of trouble. But I got to ask my Christian friends, why don't you believe in the Book of Mormon? And they don't in a huge way. And that's okay. So I need permission to apply those same standards 
the New Testament for a Jew. Again, I want to get back to this because I'm so grateful for my Christian friends and they do so much fantastic good in the world and they're such good friends of Israel and their only goal in life is to be obedient to God, just like me. So I, I don't want the fact that my journey led me out of the church and I, and I have to I will say this, I think it should lead any Jew out of the church. I think it's, the, it's so clear if you're reading through the Bible, it's just so clear. In fact, there's a great series on this. One of the things that helped me at the time I don't know if you're familiar with Rabbi Tuvia Singer. Sure. He's got a great series called Let's Get Biblical, and he's very funny. But uh, anyway, all that stuff helped lead me away. It started with David Steinberg. The, the next stop was Michael Medved when I got back to AIDS, because I was living in Ireland for almost two years doing this youth ministry. I was youth minister by day, but actually by Wednesday night and Sunday morning, and I was film writer by day. And when I got back, I met Michael Medved at a film festival. We were both on the board of advisors for this film festival in the Midwest. And he was wearing a yarmulke. And I thought he was a Christian up until then because he was always quoted in Christian magazines because he was so conservative. And he invited me to his house for Shabbos lunch. And that was really the beginning of, of the end of my Christianity. Although it was another three years, three, four years of slow winding out. I met my wife in the church. We were married in the church by a Jewish for Jesus rabbi. Not the young lady you had been dating. No, because I, look, I, I went away to film school. We sort of agreed to date other people because we really wanted to give it a real shot, this make the year count. And within the year, I, we were both dating other people. We were both kind of watching each other to see what was going to happen. <laughs> and it became really clear I wasn't coming back. And she got married. You know, I went off to Ireland. So there's, you know, a lot of time went by. Um, like I said, to this day, I'm, I'm in touch with her mom. And her mom has just been great, you know. So this new cute blonde girl <laughs> in a different Presbyterian church. And we start dating and she wants to know where I'm going on Saturday morning. So I started going to visit Michael Medved and his shul. So at the time, they had just brought in a new young rabbi, Rabbi Goldberg, Shlomo Goldberg, who runs a wonderful Jewish day school here called uh, Yeshiva or Eliyahu. And going to his banquet, my wife and I looked at each other and said, we have to have kids so we can send them to this school. We were so touched by the quality of the staff and the teaching of this rabbi and the Torah and the love. And it was just amazing. And he became just dear to our family. And we were learning so much in his classes. And not at first. At first, we were just visiting the shul. My wife really liked it. And we were going to shul and church for years. Was she Jewish? Nope. nope. So we were, we were going to both. And again, this is all on the video. And it's Mackie's wacky story. We were having, you know... Passover seders for the church people and Kentucky Fried Chicken for Shabbos dinners with, you know, tape recorders playing the benching. And it was a crazy time. And it took, I don't know, it was a five-year journey from starting to visit shuls to eventually stopping going to church. It was a very slow, it was a gentle way to do it. And to the credit of the folks at PJC and Michael and Rabbi Goldberg, nobody ever challenged us on why we were going to church. And because of that, I felt safe to continue visiting with them. And one day I just stepped out of the Christian boat and stepped into the Jewish life boat and just quietly rode away without even noticing I had done it in a way. Mm. And it was really a full year later that I finally was able to formally verbalize that I had left that old faith. And then my wife and I continued down the path. She eventually went through a full conversion with the RCC, Rabbinical Council of California, which is sort of the supreme, <laughs> the supreme quorum of holy rabbis. And a um, <laughs> bunch of great guys, really special guys, because they, they really looked at where we were and where we'd come from and made some astounding decisions about letting us do and not do things that made it possible for us to continue when we might not have been ready otherwise, which I never, I always hear, oh, these guys are implacable, impossible. And um, my experience was that they were quite insightful. And I don't want to say flexible, because I don't like, nobody should go, hey, David says they're flexible. They were, in our case, really creative and, and loving. Anyway, um, we finished the conversion. We went through the mikvah, not together. I went in, though, um, the rabbis had me go in to formally renounce my previous faith, because I had, but that's not, I'd been so high profile. I mean, if you look on the bookshelves back here, there's a video series back there that ran that was advertised with the Kardashian kids on <laughs> late television that I was the executive producer of that I wrote. There's Vacation Bible School. There are Christian books by famous evangelists. I had done the video series for Josh McDowell, Evidence that the Men, well, not Evidence that the Men's Verdict, but he did a number of college and high school campaigns that I was the director of all his media for. Under the Bellas, you know, and so I, I, at one point I had, I had material in, five or six different booths at the Christian Booksellers Convention, which is like the largest traveling road show of convention center shows. And so they wanted me to formally renounce what I had done, even though that wasn't a halakhic requirement. And by that time, it was effortless to say those words. But again, with the Hakorsa Tov for the people in the church who had loved me and who had lifted me up and, and really at the end of the day had primed me to be ready to be an observant Jew. 
because yeah. it was their love of scripture and their intense desire to be obedient to God that caused me, every time I read Benching, I went, why aren't we in the church reading these prayers after a meal? It says, after you're satisfied, you will pray. Why are we just throwing our hands up at the beginning and saying thank you? And then we don't do the biblical command to give thanks after your meal when you're satisfied. Why aren't we keeping the Sabbath like these crazy Jews? It says that the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. What's going on with that? And so I'm asking, I'm just turning it on. And I expected, here's the crazy thing. And I expected my Christian friends to follow me into the synagogue. Because I was dedicated to pursuing truth at any cost. Wherever it leads, that's where I'm going to go. And it led back to Judaism. And my Christian friends followed me right up until the time I said, I don't believe in Jesus. And then mm -hmm. suddenly it was like, okay. Follow the yellow brick road. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs> no, my, my good Christian friends have stayed with me as, a, as in friendship. I was going to ask if you would maintain any of those relationships. The deeper Christian friendships have remained. You know, a few of them are quietly praying for my salvation because they're really mm -hmm. terrified I'm going to burn in hell. The more middle of the road ones aren't worried about my salvation, but they would love to see me come back, I guess. And then I have a couple who are, who now and then will try some loopy thing to try and I think they'll be able to convince me to come back. Right. Tell me, David, a little bit about, in the time we have left, I want to hear a little bit about your work. It sounds like you were into the performance side of things, and yet your ultimate success has come on the behind the scenes of the writing and the creative side of things. Well, it's funny. Um, that's sort of the hand of God, because it's such a great lifestyle to be a writer. I can, have, <laughs> I can keep Chavez without a problem. I can keep the holidays without a problem. I can be home for dinner every night. Now, television writing is a little bit different, but on the film side, Get the work done, nobody cares where or how you do it. And so it was really, I think, sort of the hand of God going, I see you wanna be obedient, I'm gonna give you a career that satisfies this need you have for showbiz. And like, there's nothing more fun than going to a premiere and <laughs> those Chuck Grauman's Chinese in a limo with your kids, your wife. I mean, that's, that's a freaking rush, you know what I mean? It's great. But it just sort of worked out that way. I had, a, I had an acting agent in film school. I was doing kind of both for commercials. Yeah. And I did a couple little tiny nothing spots here and there that nothing came of it. It just, the film side took off. And the directing was going fairly well, but the writing, you had to write in order to direct. And the writing worked. People hired me. People paid me. They liked it. And then All Dogs Go to Heaven got made. That was my first film. You know, that's probably one of the most seminal projects because it was the first. I went to the theater and watched my name go up on the screen, written by, I wrote a movie. Holy Moses. That was a, <laughs> that just blew my mind. Then Rockadoodle was also done in Ireland. It didn't do as well, and it was a little more convoluted and confused. But then I hooked up with my writing partner. We were working on a Nickelodeon show called Roundhouse, which was a lot of fun sketch comedy variety show. And we got this job on the Rugrats together. We sort of kind of winded our way. We did some other smaller things for that company. And then they went, wow, you guys are pretty good. Let's have you run this series. We'll bring it back into production. And then they asked us to do the movies, and Rugrats, Rugrats in Paris, and specials, and the Hanukkah special, which so. Probably the two most things, the things I'm most proud of in my career would be the Rugrats Hanukkah, just because we tell the story of Hanukkah to millions of, of children all over the world. You know, when I grew up on just Frosty the Snowman and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you know, claymation shows. Uh, also, there's a lot of my personal life in these things. Um, the Rugrats Hanukkah story tells the story of two old guys coming together who had been friends, but then had gone apart and now were bitter rivals. And at the heart of that rivalry is the fact that one of them has all these Rugrats that he's always bragging about and the other one can't have kids. But the grandfather wasn't aware of that. He thought his friend was just kind of addicted to business and money. And so they come together over that. That meant a lot to me because my wife and I had a real struggle to have kids. Mm. It looked like for quite a while we wouldn't have any. And so that's there. And all dogs go to heaven. There's sort of a love letter and a kiss goodbye to my mom at the end of that. That goodbye isn't forever. Charlie explains to Anne-Marie. So she's able to put her arms around him and say goodbye then. Well, then goodbye, Charlie, as he goes off to heaven. Um, you know, since I'd started with this pursuit of looking for some place where there would be peace and love forever, you know, yeah. when this world ended. So those are two of my favorites. Shrek 2 is obviously was probably the most important career-wise. Right. That movie is, a, is like a net, working on a NASA space project. You know, Andrew Adamson, the director, had such a vision for what he wanted to do with the meet the parents angle. But we all really struggled because he had these idiots get married in the first movie. So it's, usually that's you're planning a wedding or this is the fiance. And so what's at stake is whether or not they'll get married. So you know, that was a bit of a conundrum. They have to, he was always hitting himself on the head. Why did I do that? I'm like, yeah, why did you? <laughs> <laughs> but the team that we had on that, it were four writers. My, my partner, David Stem, my, and myself are two. And then Andrew had a, his a buddy, Joe Stillman, 
And between that and the seven or eight brilliant storyboard artists, it was really like a NASA comedy team. So that was, that was a real privilege, and it was great for our careers, obviously. Do you always write in pairs? Because of the showman in me, that's really where I come from. I perform. And so if you sit me by myself with a typewriter, there's no one to perform for. So I'm smart. I can write. I'll sit and type stuff. It never reaches the level as the stuff I come up with when I'm in a room pitching. And so now, you know, if my partner's not available, I'll call a friend up and say, hey, let's have coffee. In fact, this last several weeks, I've, I've got a couple interns and I've formed a little writer's room. I'm like, look, you guys got some ideas. Let's, we'll, I'll take stuff out to the agency. You know, we'll see if we can't get something going and get you guys gigs. And it's been a blast. And they're like, they love sitting on the table because that's where I shine and they're learning. And I'm getting a lot more done than I would sitting, you know, when my writing partners run around. And then he doesn't have to sit and listen to me all day. Not fair to him. He is actually very gifted at just sitting quietly and thinking. That's more his strength. So it's kind of a neat thing. It just there's echoes to me of the study partner dialectic that allows for creativity to emerge in Talmud study. I tell people all the time that my writing partner and I write like Behavuta. It's just as iron sharpens iron, so one man. And it is, and, it, and we argue that way. And I'll even, every now and then look at me funny, like, why are you singing? Because I'll go, if you want to say an act three, she's going to come back around. Then I'm going to ask, I'm going to say to you, why in act two did she first do this other thing with that guy? And he's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> it makes so much sense to me. But, and then he'll go, no, but, and then, and then the thing that comes out of it, the synthesis that comes out of, yeah. you know. Is your partner Jewish? No, he's not. He's not. He's a, he's a wonderful, incredibly philosophical, thoughtful guy, but he's not Jewish. And it makes him a little crazy sometimes just because I'm so Jewish. <laughs> he watched me go through this journey and it's, it can be annoying because I'm always off speaking now because I really love, I'm an evangelist. Yeah. That, that is my thing more than anything. I'm just a born evangelist. And that's one of the things I liked about the church was that they had a job called evangelist. And now I kind of look at it like in a way it's sort of, I mean, I love show business and I love telling stories and I love making movies. And I'm, I just feel so lucky that I get to be in this business that I love. But now I kind of joke sometimes that I got to get another movie made somehow so that I can get out there and speak more because <laughs> it helps make me relevant. You know, I can say things that a rabbi can't say in a way. Like that guy's saying, well, he wrote, he works in Hollywood, and, and yet he's saying that the putting spill on means a lot to him. I yeah. expect the rabbi to say that. I don't expect the guy that, yeah. uh, are we there yet with Ice Cube, <laughs> just to say, but I need to fill in. Obviously, Hollywood is not known as the most hospitable environment, at least for conventional spiritual or moral uh, connection, uh, at least as espoused by, you know, observant Judaism. Do you ever have these sort of conflict points, inflection points that you sort of feel uh, that tension with? And, and how do you deal with those points of tension? You know, it's funny. Um, I haven't really run into that so much, which is a nice thing. You know, Hollywood is filled with a lot of hardworking middle class people, Right. They don't make the news, but right. that's the rank and file of Hollywood. People just trying to feed their families and do good work. That's really, the people that I know in Hollywood, that's what's going on. They're worried about the same things you and I are worried about. They're worried about their health insurance. They're worried about their kids' health. They're worried about their kids' education. You know, that's what's going on. So yes, the celebrities and the big shots and all that stuff, there's that. Where, where I'm in conflict is I can't open my mouth politically. I don't dare say a word. Being pro-Israel, that's not so bad because there are a lot of Jews in. Thank God the pro-Israel thing. I don't, I don't say much, though. I don't get into the Palestinian part of it. But otherwise, just the fact that I'm a conservative person, if I don't come out and overtly condemn the current president, then I myself am, am a racist and an evil, horrible person. Yeah. And I've had people scream at me out of the blue because I said, well, I'm not sure that this travel ban is such a horrible thing. And it's not a travel ban anyway. It's a, just saying that, and people got red in the face and, and screamed. And I, I lost a friend over, and I, I, I was sort of, I was really wounded. I was like, look, you know who I am. I'm a thoughtful, good person. I don't happen to fully agree with you on this particular thing. And there are, there is that knee-jerk group think that goes on where, the us and them, and, and that, that horrible dialogue that isn't dialogue. And I grew up with, look, we should be able to completely disagree and love each other yeah. and respect each other. And I'm not seeing that much, so I just keep my head down and keep my mouth shut. Do you think the recent scandals that have broken that really emerged out of Hollywood, the sexual scandals and things like that, or here in December of 2017, do you think that's going to change anything in Hollywood? A greater appreciation for traditional morality? You know, I hate, I'm a very optimistic guy. I really, but in the big, big picture, I, because I think God runs the world at the end of the day, it's all going to work out okay. We have to do our part. I'm sure we can never shirk. 
But our part is usually less than we think in some ways. We should do more than we're doing probably. But, but mostly what we do is we worry and we, and we say, isn't this terrible? And that's not really doing anything. That's just, we're, we were outraged. There's a lot of people being outraged and being outraged feels good. We, we changed our, the color of our picture on Facebook in solidarity with something. So I kind of like, you know, I want to quietly just keep my side of the street clean and not do things that I'll have to apologize for on Twitter and, and encourage everyone else to do the same. And I like to think that it will change. I like to think that women will be safer, or that every, everyone will be safer, and that, you know, any kind of predatory behavior and abuse in any way, please, God, let this have an effect of putting a damper on that. At the end of the day, mankind is mankind. And I don't see any huge pendulum that suddenly we're going to be enlightened in some new way. Uh, you know, we had Attila the Hun and we had the Cossacks. We had a lot of, throughout history, crusade, whatever, there's, there's always crazy stuff going on and there'll always be more crazy stuff. There'll always be a Kim Jong-un and whatever. So I don't see a huge shift or change, but I, I welcome this dialogue and I welcome that the victims are being listened to and that, and that powerful predators are thinking twice and are falling down. I think that's all, that's all great stuff. But there will be new atrocities and we have to just stay vigilant. And more importantly, I think we have to really focus on ourselves and we do our part. Make yourself the best human being you can be. It's such a full-time job. I'm so busy trying to be less of an idiot and less of a jerk to, or to the people immediately around me and ask anyone. I got a long way to go. So I really don't have a lot of time to look at and go, hey, you should stop doing that other thing over there. Yeah. Um, and I guess other than that full-time job of constantly being a better person, just close by telling us what's next for David Weiss. Any major projects on the horizon? Uh, where, what can we expect to see out of you uh, in, in the coming months or years? Uh, we've got the sequel to Enchanted. Disenchanted is over at Disney and they've attached the director. It's going very slowly. So it's sort of breaking my heart because the longer it takes, you know, that, that doesn't help the odds of it actually getting shot um, anytime yeah. soon. But, but we're still hopeful that that'll be the next big picture. And then we've got a spec script, a new spec script that we've just gone out with, with Greg Silverman, who is a, he's a new producer, but he was for 10 years the studio chief at Warner Brothers. So he's a fairly well-connected guy. And so that script, which is basically the story of the man in the mirror, uh, how he got in there. Mirror, mirror on the wall. He's the fairest of them all. That guy. How did he get in there and how does he get out? Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were pitching some TV stuff. So Thank you, David. And is there somewhere that people can find you online specifically to learn more about your work? Uh, you know, I don't have a particular website, but if you just Google my name, a lot, a lot of stuff comes up on Google and you can look for videos. And um, if you want to reach out, I don't necessarily always personally answer uh, emails, but dwspeaking at gmail.com. DW, like David Weiss, speaking. It's, it's sort of my speaking arm uh, email and interns in the office. We'll, we'll pick that up. And there you go. Thank you very much, David Weiss. Take care. Be well. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting patreon.com that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash jews you should know finally if you have enjoyed this podcast please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to jews you should know